This right here, folks, is 930 kilometres of off-road paradise. This is what's on my doorstep. G'day and welcome to Oz Solo. As the name suggests, this is a 100% solo production. I film, present and even fly the drone totally solo. I'm ultra passionate about showing you Australia through my eyes. Just wait till you see what I found out here. Jump in and ride along on this episode of Oz Solo. Well, welcome back to another Oz Solo. I've been looking forward to doing this particular trip for years. WA has two tracks that are world famous. One, the Bibbleman track. It's a long distance, over a thousand kilometers of hiking track. The second, the Mundabidi track, perhaps the world's longest continuous mountain bike track, just over a thousand kilometers long, going from the Perth Hills all the way down to the south coast. But there was never a dedicated four-wheel drive track that did the same thing. In 2019, a dedicated four-wheel drive track was unveiled at the Perth four-wheel drive show. Fast forward now to 2023, and that one track that goes down south has become a four and a half thousand kilometer loop comprising five different stages. And I am about to do stage one at 930 kilometers in length I'd like to welcome you to the Mundell track. Ah, oh my giddy aunt! <laughs> I'm going to knock some pressure out of these tyres. I'm currently sitting on 45 psi. I'm going to knock what remaining brain cells I've got straight out my ears. Well, I'll be stuffed. I haven't seen one of these. Shivers, it'll be decades. This right here is a shield tree, or I always knew them as a blaze tree dates back to the 1920s and is actually a grid reference that foresters out here used to use in order to find their way around because heaven forbid, back in the day, we didn't have GPSs. Now, I can actually remember growing up in the Southwest and we would actually use these blaze trees to find our way through the forestry tracks down to the beach. That one there, she's an absolute cracker. Let's keep going. I'll stick with the GPS in the vehicle though, if that's okay with you guys. I uh, fueled up early this morning right up back at Mundaring. I used to live in the hills, so I know Mundaring well. It actually goes back in the family. My granddad played cricket for the Mundaring Cricket Club. And they were premiers back in the day. It actually made the news. Granddad, get around him. <laughs> also, back when I was first starting out as a photojournalist, whenever I had to shoot any sort of custom four wheel drive, I would take them to a very well known local track. That being, of course, the Mundaring Powerline track. It's like any Powerline track, pretty gnarly, but it provided the exact details that I needed in order to photograph four-wheel drives right back in the day. So, used to live up in the hills, Grandad played cricket up in the hills, I went on to play cricket for Kalamunda many, many years later. The less I say about that, the better. Photography career started up that way. A lot of history, a lot of history. I'm loving being back in the big G Uzi. I've kind of been a bit smitten, a bit in love, a bit taken with the Y62 over the last year. I haven't really driven the old girl. In fact, I haven't driven a vehicle that requires you to change gears <laughs> in quite a while. So doing that, the old left leg gets a workout. She had a couple of minor changes too, the big rig. We put a brand new set of uh, Bridgestone Muddies back on, 285, 75, R16s, 33s in the old language. Up front, we've put a uh, brand new winch, a Runva 13 XP. Now, you've seen us, we put them through absolute hell on the show. So, the Runva was gonna be the winch for me and a 13 XP because she's a plus size model, this old girl. She heavy, she real heavy. I've mounted my Max Tracks properly up on my roof rack using some proper mounting pins. I reckon those things have saved my bacon more times than I can count. Uh, and I was holding them down with a dirty old ratchet strap, which I'm still doing on the Y62, I've gotta change that. Look, apart from that, in the last year I've given the old girl a service, she's been sitting in the shed on life support, and it just feels nice. After being kind of spoilt with the new D-Max, the Y62, it's nice to get back in something kind of old school. You know, you can hear it, you've got to drive it, you've got to hold onto it, you've got to change gears. It's kind of shaky and there's a noise back there, I don't know what that is, and it, you know, I built this vehicle, and it just, it's a part of me, it's a part of who I am, and it's, 
bloody good to be back in the old girl, plodding along through these beautiful forests. <laughs> I'm enjoying it, if you can't tell. Pretty remote right now. It's a little section that I've wanted to check out for a number of years, never had the chance to get through here and check it out. It's not much left, like a lot of ruins, but it's a heck of a story to why I have stopped. This is the Jarradale POW camp, or what's left of the POW camp. I bet many of you didn't even realise that Western Australia had prisoner of war camps. This one is the W20 camp. It goes back from 1944 to 1946, and it housed Italian prisoners from the Africa campaign of World War II. Now, what's really interesting about the story out here, the camp itself closed down in 1946, and one of the rules of POW camps were that all of the prisoners, all of the Italian prisoners, had to go back to Italy. Most of them, when they got back to Italy, applied for a visa to come back and live and work with their families in WA. They were sponsored to do so by a lot of the local farmers around here who put them to work on the orchards and of course most of them eventually ended up having land of their own. But down there, that's the old Trigwell Bridge ruins. New bridge just here, nowhere near as exotic. Old bridges mean structure, structure means fish, fish means lunch. Zero guarantees, that's why I've got a pine there. Well, it's a magic little spot, but the fish didn't get the memo. Now, I'm getting hungry. Let's find somewhere for lunch, eh? Of course, this whole area through here, bauxite mining. It's everywhere. <laughs> Look at this. There's some pretty inventive ways of them getting the haul trucks back and forth. What a tunnel. Middle of nowhere. <laughs> Talk of mining. That right there is a conveyor belt taking bauxite from the mine sites down to the processing plant, runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't need a driver for it, you just load your bauxite onto that conveyor belt and away it goes. Now, what's interesting is, some of my past old solos, you will have seen me go down to some coastal areas where there is black rubber matting on some of the sand dunes to make it easier to get up so you don't degrade the sand dunes. That black rubber matting comes from down there. It's the conveyor belt matting from these conveyors when they break down or the mats split they uh, get donated to the full drive clubs and they put them in on these sand dunes. I've often wondered about jumping on <laughs> and just zooming down to the processing plant, saying good day to the boys, having a beer at five o'clock. Something tells me that would be very, very illegal. Holy balls. In filming that little segment there, my drone just had a freaking conniption and decided it was gonna head back to China. And it just went 423 meters, according to the GPS, directly into the thickest bush you've ever seen back that way. Somehow, I managed to track it. This little drone, I tell you what, I actually said to myself, if it makes it through this trip, I'm gonna retire it and get myself a new one. When I first got this drone, the very first day, I took it out on a neighboring property up the road from me and I flew it straight into the highest Jarrah tree you've ever seen in your life. It stayed up there for two months before it finally got blown down in a storm and I found it next to the base of the tree many, many moons later. I've flown it into cliff faces. It has been places no drone should go, but I think it's okay. <laughs> I think it lives to see another day. Lucky I didn't drop it in the bloody dam. Yeah, that's wobbly too, I broke it another one. Well, I reckon it is time for me to have a beer. Let's get to camp. <laughs> Ooh -wee. A little squeezy bit, there we are. When I was doing a bit of research on the Mundell track, one thing that sort of kept coming up as being a reoccurring theme for the entire track was that it was designed so that you had opportunity to plug in other encounters whilst doing the track. So for example, it goes past a lot of small country towns. So you can zip in, you can get some fuel, you can go to the pub for a, a pub lunch if you want to. You're kind of encouraged to use the track as a way to get to other places or to do other things. So I'm doing that exact thing right now. I'm off the track by about half an hour, roughly half hour detour. And I'm heading in to a little spot I know down by the river to camp for the night. You know what I like? I like this bit right here.
<laughs> How good is that? Have a go at this, will ya? Oh, it's just, you get into camp, you've got the entire place to yourself. There's the sound of the red-tailed blacks up in the trees behind me. That is not the best bit. That is a pretty good bit. But let me show you this. This is what's on my doorstep. given any thought to sense of place. I talk about it a bit amongst mates because I feel it extremely strongly. We travel Australia every year and I've been doing so full time as a job and for fun pretty much since 2005. Every year, a lap of Australia. Don't know how many times I've done it. And I love the place. I bleed Australian. I bloody love it. And I feel at home anywhere in Australia. I am very familiar with all parts of the country. But sense of place for me occurs down here in the Capes region between Cape Naturalist and Cape Lewin and about the same distance back inland again. It's a connection to that country that I can physically, physically feel inside me and I'm getting closer now to being back down there and I can feel it. It's a strange thing, I know it sounds kooky. I've only had one beer, trust me. Sense of place, I'd love to know in the comments down below, how many of you guys have got a sense of place. Your country, where you feel you should belong, where you always come back to, where you know is where you're supposed to be. For me, it's the Southwest region. Nowhere else in the world gives me this sense of feeling like the Southwest region. We're currently midway through marin season 2023. What's a marin? Freshwater crayfish, native only to the rivers, streams, lakes of Southern WA. This spot right here is very well known by the locals surprised I've got it to myself tonight and I reckon that stretch of river would have been picked clean. However, we're going to throw them in because if you don't have a go, you'll never know. Rightio, tonight I'm having something that I've had a thousand times before but I have never had it like this. Mashed potato, some greens and a good old fashioned Aussie steak. However, this steak has been in my canopy unrefrigerated for the last three months. It's a steak in a bag. No, it's not dehydrated, reconstituted. It's an actual ridgy didge piece of slow cooked Australian steak. One little cooking tip. Stay with me here. Mashed potatoes. The first thing you should do is fry some onions in the same bowl that you're gonna boil your mashed potatoes in. Then put your onions back in your mashed potato and swirl them around. Trust me when I say you will never, ever do mashed potatoes again without fried onions. For the love of all things holy, that is steak in a bag, it's a thing. That is amazing. That's freaking incredible. Look at that big chunky boy there. Have a go at that. I'll catch us in the morning. Good night. Get a load of, holy shiver me timbers. Get a load of this. Look at that. Just a massive load, pardon the pun, of bog roll. I think I may just have come up with something that might just help that situation. Come and check this out. Oh, I gotta pick that up, don't I? Have a look at this right here. Looks like a normal toilet roll. <laughs> Works like a normal toilet roll. However, it's not. It's designed to go with those chemical toilets that you get in uh, caravans, or you can even get the port loose you can, you can chuck one in the four-wheel drive if you wanted to, but we are all using the wrong toilet rolls out here in the bush. Go to your local camping store, and in the caravanning section, with all the weird chemicals that you use for the toilets, 
you'll find these special toilet rolls. Grab yourself a six pack. Folks, if every one of us uses these biodegradable toilet rolls out in the bush, I reckon that toilet paper, which you see for months and months and months afterwards, will break down significantly quicker. So come on folks, let's all get together, chuck your normal toilet rolls back in the house, go and get yourself some biodegradable ones, and let's see if we can't knock this problem on the head. I talk a lot of crap, but this is legit. Now, I mentioned that I'm gonna be doing the Mundell track. The reason it's called the Mundell track is that each of the five sections get their name from the town you start in and the town you finish at. The route in its entirety is known as just the track because, of course, you make up the name of the track you're doing based on the leg, one of the five that you're gonna be doing. I'm doing Mundaring to Albany, so my part of the track is called the Mundell track. Now, the other really unique thing about the track is that there are no paper maps for the track. The way you follow it is by jumping online and downloading all the coordinates turn by turn. You then use those coordinates to plug into your GPS or mapping software of choice and the whole thing opens up to you. You can follow it turn by turn. Now, what that enables is that let's say a bushfire sweeps through here and this section gets closed. All they've got to do is just jump online, alter the GPS points to go around the bushfire area, and when you download those points and plug them in, you've got a brand new track that goes around the section that would ordinarily have been closed, and you wouldn't have been able to update that on a paper map. So it's fluid, a damn good idea. I've got a big day ahead of me today, I want to try and cover a fair bit of ground. It's nice to be getting away now from that mining activity. It's almost like when you stop, there's kind of like a hum in the air, like a you can just hear it everywhere you are up there. So it's nice to be heading back south now, getting away from all that. This one right here is called a Christmas tree by us white folk because flowers like this round about December, just in time for Christmas. Locally, traditionally, it's known as the Mujah. I think its scientific name is Nutsia floribunda. There you go, where'd I pull that one out of? Absolutely special tree, especially to the indigenous cultures of Southwest WA. It had so many uses for it. The bark was used to make shields. It exudes like a sticky gum. Uh, that was given to the kids as like a sweet. Those flowers you can see up there, they're in profusion at the moment, dipped in water. They made like a sweet honey, like a mead almost. So many different uses for this bad boy right here. It's covered in butterflies. There's bees all over it. If you ever get a chance to check one of these things out in person, stop and have a look at them because they are absolutely gorgeous. I was just getting some footage then of a weird looking sign that I saw. I bumped into the ranger, she was driving up. She just stopped, make sure I was okay, said g'day. I told her I was doing the Mundell track, she'd never heard of it before. I explained what it was, she said, oh, what direction are you going? I said, I'm heading south. And she said, oh, good. You're gonna start coming into God's country. And I know what she means. And I can already start to see the country start to change. You know, we're into that mixed agriculture, farming, wheat and sheep. Over here, of course, we've got a pine plantation. Don't worry about that. And we're about to get into those really magic deep south forests that I freaking love. So, the ranger was right. Welcome to God's country. Let's get stuck into it. This is what I love about these sort of places. This spot right here is not marked on the map at all. Uh, it's not on wiki camps. I just happened to be driving along, saw a little sidetrack, took it, and I found this. Check this out. Look at that. She goes right the way down there. And I love it, it's not on the maps. You guys won't know where this is. You have to be a local to find this, it'd have to be coming through here. That is why tracks like this that I'm doing are so important. I found this and I'll be back with the canoes. I am way out there right now, like I'm miles from the nearest bit of bitumen and I've been on gravel for hours. And then out of the blue, pops <laughs> just this random little piece of bitumen. It's so old. The bitumen's got moss growing on it. <laughs> I'm guessing this used to be a lo logging road and the logging trucks must have had a bit of trouble getting up here in the wet maybe. And so they've just laid this one little tiny piece just here. How bizarre. All right, let's keep moving. Ooh, get a load of this. Pretty unique sort of an old bridge, this one. Look at the size of the timbers in it. I don't think you'd want to slip off this one. My little 33s would fit right in there, I reckon. There you go. <laughs> That's cool. Well, since stopping for a bite of lunch. I've made a mile. Sort of just put my head down and driven for a bit. And that mixed agricultural sort of terrain we were driving through has 
vanished and it was as if someone flicked a switch. Have a go at the tall timber country we're in now and that signifies we are definitely getting south now. Carry trees all around us, stunning bit of country. Holy balls man, I love this place. <laughs> Just talking of carry trees and I saw this one down, I thought I'd better show you. This is only a small one, piece of it there, piece there. So this is not, a, this is not one of the bigger ones, but have a go at the size of this bugger. It's roughly one gram in width, which is approximately six foot two. <whistles> yeah, is this for a spot, eh? I haven't been down here for years. Absolutely spectacular. Nothing's changed, no rubbish. It's a gorgeous little spot. Not a bad spot to get the old head wet. Oh, come here. I literally just passed the only car that I've seen <laughs> all the day. Now, I have got a bit of a decision to make. The Mundell continues on now for about another half a day, roughly, to get me into the town of Albany. I don't really need to go into the town of Albany, but just off the Mundell, just down here, is a little spot that I freaking love. Paradise on Earth, right on the south coast, so it's still taking me from the Perth Hills all the way down to the south coast, but it is just ever so slightly off the Mundell track. Decisions, decisions, decisions. It's a tough job, this one. Well, have a go at that. The choice is pretty darn obvious. <laughs> Sensational. Well, the Mundell track, what do I think of it? Thoroughly enjoyed it, but that northern section up around where all the mining is at, I reckon they need to reroute that one out east a bit further and just avoid all that altogether. This southern half, southern section, perfect. Thoroughly enjoyable. If you don't have the time or the inclination to do the whole thing, my advice would be drop in around about the Collie region and head south from there, because that is God's country from there all the way south. The good news is that's leg one of five done. I've still got four to go and there anything like this, I am in for a real treat. They're all for another day, however. Today, somehow, I've got this entire beach to myself. I'm gonna find camp, I'll catch you folks next time on Old Solo. <laughs>